Good morning, welcome to UCLA. Uh, my name is John Moriarty. I'm one of the Interventional Radiology Associate Professors here. And uh, what I'd like to do over the next 20 minutes or so is chat to you a bit about IVC filters. This is something you've probably heard about or seen something about on TV, often uh, associated with a lawsuit or a problem where uh, someone has had an issue with either uh, taking them out or it breaking. And so I'd like to give you a bit of background as to what an IVC filter is and uh, what we talk about when we say it's working or it's broken. This is uh, going to be, uh, as I said, about 20 minutes long and then we're going to answer some questions and uh, we'd love to hear your, uh, any questions that come from you. You can find us on the, uh, with the Twitter hashtag as you see there. And if you can't find us online, we would love to see you in person. And so you can contact us at any of our uh, locations. We're distributed throughout Los Angeles. We have our Westwood uh, uh, Vein and Filter Clinic, also within Santa Monica, and then in the South Bay down in, uh, in Manhattan Beach. And you can call us at any time at any, of, uh, at any of those locations through the number that's on the screen. And what I'm going to be doing is really running through three very simple questions. First off, what is an IVC filter? Secondly, why would you one be put in? Why do patients have these put in and a very large number throughout the United States every day of the week? And then thirdly, and probably most importantly, why and how is one taken out? Because this is where the problems are developing increasingly. So first off, as I said, this is something you probably have heard a little bit about already. This is a hot topic. This is something that there are lots of ads, whether it's on TV, Facebook, or uh, in the print media. And they predominantly relate to lawsuits and class action lawsuits related to these IVC filters. And you're going to see uh, ads being put out by lawyer groups or by patient interest groups related to their function and particularly to dysfunction. And there are lots of these around. So I'm going to try and break down some of the kind of background to why you're going to be seeing these over the next while. And I'm going to start with what is an IVC filter. So the idea behind an IVC filter is that you want it to catch clot. And I'll talk more about where the clot is when it starts off and where we want to prevent it from going in a minute. But an IVC filter is essentially a cage. It's a small metal cage that sits in one of your blood vessels. This is one located here. So you can see it's about the size of the width of your hand. And it goes into one of your blood vessels in your belly. And what you want to do is have it block the blood flow that's coming up through the red arrow here, up through it, allowing the blood flow to go past, but any clots that are within it to come out. And they all have this kind of common sort of design where you've got various different metal parts and then at the top of it a hook here seen with the green arrow and this hook is so it can be taken out it's what's called retrievable and this is very important when it comes to when I discuss how you don't need this forever in the vast majority of people so most IVC filters look like this but they can look like something else because there are different designs made by different companies as they sit within the vein they are designed to stop the blood clot the blood clot is a big chunk of hardened blood that is traveling through the body. And these are, uh, are designed and engineered to catch that blood clot in transit. So most IVC filters look like this, but there are lots of other ways that they can appear as well. Whether it's more like a cage or whether there is uh, a sort of Starship Galactica sort of appearance where it'll block the, uh, the clot on multiple levels or indeed where it looks more like a tennis racket with a web that'll catch the clot and then these um, sort of metal spheres that'll allow you to, uh, to, to keep within the blood vessel. They all have different designs but the basics are the same and that is that you want to have something that will attach itself to the blood vessel so it doesn't move but will catch the clot that comes through the middle of that blood vessel. And so when we're talking about blood clots, really we're talking about DVT or deep vein thrombosis. And so these blood clots are usually found within the legs. And so the, the, the history that we often hear is someone who has, for example, a long flight. You've flown over from Australia or Europe, you land in LAX, you've got 14 hours worth of sitting in economy behind you, and your leg gets swollen. That's because there's a blood clot within that leg. 
And these blood clots are your own normal blood that gets thickened and hard and forms clumps. And then these clumps then can either stay within the leg or they can move. And this is really common. This is one of the most common afflictions that can happen to people. Here in the United States, somewhere around about three per thousand of the population are going to develop one every single year. There are about a little less than a million people who are going to get it in the country. And it's not only very prevalent, in other words, we see a lot of it, but also it's very deadly. So it's the third most common cause of cardiovascular death after heart attacks and stroke. And if you develop one of these events, a blood clot either in the legs or as I'm going to talk about in the lungs, you've got about a 20% chance of dying. Now, you don't always die because of the blood clot. You may die because, for example, you have a cancer that caused the blood clot. But this is a very serious event and something we want to take very seriously and give you the best possible treatment for. So if most of the blood clots are formed within the legs, the route of the blood out of the legs is through the pelvis into one big blood vessel. A little anatomy lesson here that this blood vessel is called the IVC or inferior vena cava. And it is in blue here on the screen. It runs straight up the middle of your belly, behind your belly button, towards your spine. And it takes all the blood from the lower half of your body back to the heart and lungs. And so anything that's within the veins of your legs or your pelvis has to go through this one blood vessel, this IVC, to get back to your heart and lungs. And if that's a blood clot that's in your legs that then is pushed forward by your normal flow, it can travel through this IVC in your belly to your heart and lungs and that becomes known as a pulmonary embolism. And a pulmonary embolism or PE is where the blood clot moves through the heart to the lungs. And this can be a very serious event. What happens is the blood clot lodges within the arteries, the pulmonary arteries in the lung, and it stops the ability of the lung to breathe, to give you the oxygen you need to keep going. And so if the blood clot is large enough, it can cause that area of the lung to die, to basically infarct. And this alone can be very severe, but it's especially severe when it backs up and causes the pressure on the heart to become so big that the heart can't tolerate it and the heart fails and that's usually a cause of death. This is really common. The Surgeon General has announced that this is an American crisis, that there are up to 180,000 deaths from what we just talked about PE per year and that it causes not only death but a, a lot of disability as well. And it's not just sick people, it's not just the elderly who are developing this. This is something that happens in everybody and you probably know people who've done it who've had these problems. Here in LA, a lot of our kind of famous sports stars have had medical issues. Some of our most famous have had pulmonary emboli. Serena Williams almost died from a clot several years ago. She had an excellent recovery and has obviously gone on to having a superb career again. Many basketball players, UCLA, we're very lucky now, we've, uh, we're associated with the LA Lakers, but basketball players have had blood clots somewhat famously, Jerome Kersey, who died of a blood clot. Addison Vergeau for the Cavaliers, and then you probably have seen recently that Chris Bosch, he has been stopped from playing by his team, the Miami Heat, because of blood clots within his lungs. So this is something that's very topical, people are talking about it, there's a lot of interest in exactly what to do about blood clots and importantly, how to stop them. So if you have a blood clot within the legs, we talk about the ABCs of treatment. The first one is ambulation, walking, getting going, because we want to make sure that you don't have any more immobility that can cause more blood clots. The second thing is blood thinners. So Coumadin, medications like that, that thin the blood that will prevent any more blood clots from happening. And then the third thing is compression. People often are put on to uh, leg compression stockings, again, to prevent further blood clots from, uh, from happening and prevent leg swelling. But in a large proportion of people, and a worryingly large proportion of people, though that isn't enough. And these blood clots that form within the leg can move from the legs up through the body, through this IVC, up here to the heart and lungs, and this can cause a PE. So, is there a way that we can stop the blood clots from traveling from the legs to the heart and lungs? And there is, and this is called an IVC filter. So, what we want to do is we want to put a small device here within the blood vessel which will catch the blood clot 
as it's moving on its way to somewhere where it can cause severe damage. How we put it in, it used to be a big deal. It used to be 20, 30 years ago that it was a big operation where you had your belly opened by a surgeon and a clamp placed on the IVC. Fortunately, we've come far from that. So now an interventional radiologist such as me or one of my colleagues will make what's called a minimally invasive, so tiny little nick, uh, smaller than any pen, into the blood vessel, usually over the, the hip or within the neck, and then pass a small tube into the blood vessel where we can then deploy the IVC filter. This normally takes somewhere around 20 minutes to an hour to do, and it can be done very safely with minimal complications in the vast, vast, vast majority of people. The way that we do it is we first do an ultrasound of the area because we want to make sure that there's no blood clot there. One of the things that can rarely happen is as you're putting in the filter, you can dislodge one of those blood clots and it can go to the heart and lung and cause problems at that point. But then what we do is we select the area of the IVC that we want to put the, uh, put the filter in and then we deploy it and we drop it essentially into position here so that the legs are touching the wall so that it's stuck in position, a good type of stuck at this moment, in position and it's not going to move. It will allow the blood flow to get past it but the clots will be caught within it. So that's great. They work terrifically. They're successful in preventing upwards of 95% of all blood clots from traveling from the legs to the uh, lungs. So why don't we use more of it and what, what could the potential problems be? Well, unfortunately, there are lots of things that can go wrong. DVTs, which are more clots, are more frequent once you have this filter in and they occur in different ways and perhaps more severe ways. Things like tilting, fracture, migration, which is where the IVC filter moves, and perforation. So the short answer to what can go wrong is that there's lots that can go wrong, and that's why you're going to see all these lawsuits and why you're going to see all the press about this over the, uh, over the last while. All right, so I'm going to go through some of these in, uh, over the next few minutes. Firstly, related to blood clots. Blood clots are the reason you're putting in the IVC filter. But once you have the IVC filter in position, you actually run the risk of more blood clots happening below it. So that someone who has an IVC filter for, for example, a year or two, runs the risk of developing blood clots throughout the belly. Now, they often won't be able to get to the heart and lungs, so they're not going to be typically fatal, but they can cause severe swelling, severe immobility, and in fact can go on to really of reduce your quality of life. So this is something that we see very frequently at our IVC filter clinic here at UCLA, which is people who have had a filter, they've been treated for their original problem, and then they develop big time clots in their legs, in their belly, that are caught by the filter, but are causing obstruction to flow. And this is the sort of appearance that we see. This is a CAT scan looking straight at uh, someone who has an IVC filter here where my finger is, and all of this dark stuff, this is all blood clot that's caught within the filter. The filter has done its job, but it's done it too well, and now there's clot that the body can't dissolve while it's there. And you get people with severe leg swelling, severe immobility because of this. There are lots of things that we can do to help this. This is something that we very frequently uh, work uh, on patients with. So, for example, if you have a blood clot that we can then dissolve, we can put up a device through the veins to either break it up or suck it out. In this case, this is it being broken up, an animation of the vein that is clogged up with clot getting reopened. Another way that we can do it then is we can chop up the clot so it becomes much smaller. This is all done what's called minimally invasively. So this is all through tiny keyhole, say behind your knee or in your, over your hip so that we're able to get you back up on your feet as soon as possible with a very quick recovery. Other ways that we can do it if there's larger clots is we can directly suck it out, a device called the Andrewback. This is where we are able to take large volumes of clot, remove it from your body all at one time. And this is something that we have pretty advanced experience with here in UCLA. The next complication, and the one that is, I'd say, most feared, is what's called migration. This is where the filter can move. In other words, where it's attached, where we put it into the IVC, is not where it is after a period of time. And that's because it's not attached solidly to the wall of the blood vessel. And so it can move to another blood vessel, 
or more dangerously, it can move to the heart or to the lungs. And if it moves to the heart and, or to the lungs, you run the risk of developing severe complications such as bleeding into the heart or a bad heart rhythm and death. So we again, unfortunately, see this quite frequently, whether it's the IVC filter here outside of the blood vessel, here where it's in completely the wrong blood vessel, it's moved into the wrong uh, location. This is an IVC filter up within the patient's neck. It should never be in there, it should be down within the belly, but it has moved to this location. Or indeed here on this picture of the heart, this is an IVC filter that's down within the heart. This is a very severe problem, something that we really need to jump on quickly, otherwise there's a real risk of developing complications such as death. Perforation, that's a fancy term for, for erosion of the blood vessel. And what that means is that those legs that I showed you that are there to prevent the, the filter moving, they can move through over time through the wall of the blood vessel. There's, the metal is stronger than tissue and it can go into the surrounding tissues. And so what we can see is that, for example, this is a view with a colonoscopy. This is someone's bowel and this here, this is part of the IVC filter that has eroded or perforated through the wall of the blood vessel into the bowel. And this is obviously not good for you, it causes ulceration, pain, infection, can cause bleeding, can be a severe problem and a reason to have the filter taken out immediately. The last thing I'm going to talk about as regards problems that can occur is fracture. And so these are pieces of metal, they're welded together, and with the wear and tear of the body, bits of it can break off. And so this is what a lot of the lawsuits are, uh, are dealing with. So that if one of these little legs breaks off, they can then travel. They can be pushed forward by the bloodstream into the heart, into the lungs, where they can cause problems along the level of what we discussed before. Anywhere from something that's mild and incidental to something that's very severe and can unfortunately kill the patient. So this is a, something that we watch very carefully for. It's something that we see a lot of patients in our clinic have questions about. And what we will do in almost all cases is remove the filter and remove the fragment that's broken to prevent any problems down the road. So as I said earlier, this is a kind of a hot topic. This is something that you're going to see a lot of uh, interest about from the lay media, from the medical media, from the legal, from the medical side, everything there as well. Based on all of this kind of interest, based on the fact that we know that these complications can occur, there has been a uh, movement from both the doctor point of view and also from the federal government point of view to say that all IVC filters that can be removed should be removed. In other words, that if you have an IVC filter placed, there is a proportion of people who should have it for the rest of their life. That's perfectly fine. We just need to know about it and monitor it. But in the majority of cases, if you have one of these filters placed, when you no longer need it, in other words, your blood clots have been dissolved, your risk has gone down, you should have this removed, that it should not be left in you uh, in, uh, indefinitely. The way that we remove it, it tends to be a relatively simple procedure. That hook that I showed you in one of the first slides about how these things are designed, we put down a small fishing rod, snare, that catches that hook from the vein at the, uh, at the neck and then we're able to remove it. So that this is one of the procedures. This is a patient who uh, I saw about two or three days ago. First thing is we put a tube down from the neck on the inside, completely painless. Then we inject a bit of dye to make sure that there's no blood clots, any of those complications that we encountered. The next thing is we catch the hook with this little fishing uh, net, this snare, and then we take out the filter. And this is what a filter looks like when it's been removed from the body. Little bits of clot, so it's done its job. But the rest of the filter is intact and now the patient typically feels great, goes home an hour later. However, there are, again, a proportion of people who either have already developed a problem or, for example, one of those problems we discussed, things like perforation, fracture, anything, or where the filter's been in a long time, who it's not always so simple. And that's where having a team-based approach with a filter clinic that sees a lot of people with these problems, who operates on a lot of people frequently, can be very helpful. And so we've got several advanced techniques here in our group in UCLA 
uh, to remove filters that have been in sometimes upwards of a decade. And so whether it's putting in multiple devices, again, all minimally invasive, no big surgery, very rarely needed now uh, in good centers, uh, or using little, little devices to catch the filter mechanically and remove it, or indeed sometimes we have to use a laser to actually uh, to release the filter from the tissue that's around it. Any of these techniques can be used to help remove these filters that can be pretty, uh, pretty tough and pretty scarred in. So I wanted to finish up there. There are a couple of take-home messages I think that are important when you're thinking about IBC filters. The first of those is that blood clots, DVT, is very common. There are hundreds of thousands, potentially a million patients within the United States who are going to get one this year. PE, pulmonary embolism, when the blood clot moves to the uh, heart and lungs, is frequent and it can be very severe and indeed life-threatening. IVC filters are very helpful in preventing blood clots in the legs traveling to the heart and lungs and causing this disastrous event. So they can be very good. However, it's very important to know that they come at a cost. And that cost is blood clots later on, perforation, migration and fracture and because of all of those potential costs if you have an IVC filter placed it is strongly advised that you have it removed when you don't need it anymore and most importantly you have a full discussion with your physician that we understand the risks and benefits and so all filters that can be removed should be removed when they're no longer needed so with that I'll remind you that we've got clinics throughout Los Angeles which uh, see patients with filters uh, all the time. If you have any questions, any worries, you can call us there. And uh, I'd be happy to take your questions now uh, through our Twitter uh, account. Thank you. Thank you. So a couple of quick questions here which we'll, uh, which we'll run over. The first is, uh, I have a filter for 10 years, can it be removed? The answer is yes. With more difficulty than if it's only been in a short time, but they can be removed. Our group has experienced removing filters that have been in for upwards of a decade, and it's always worth getting an expert opinion regardless of the age of the filter. Uh, another question here is, I'm worried about bits breaking off my filter and going into my heart. Do I need to do anything about it? So yes, and that's the most frequent thing that we see coming into our IVC filter clinic is someone knows they have a filter, they have seen something on television or one of their friends has told them or their uh, general practitioner has told them that they're worried about what's happening with that filter. If you have a filter, you should be seen by someone who's an expert in this and they'll evaluate you for that. The chance of you actually having a problem with the filter is relatively low, but it is something that should be evaluated and something that potentially you may want to talk about getting that filter out of you. Uh, and then... Another question, I'm not sure what type of filter I have. Can it be removed? Can they all be removed? The short answer is not 100% of them can be removed, but the longer answer is 99.9% .9 of the filters that, uh, that we see here in UCLA that come from all around the country to come to UCLA to our filter clinic. Uh, of those patients, we're able to remove upwards of 99%. So the vast, vast majority of IVC filters can be removed. So with that, I'll wrap up. I'll thank you for your time and uh, look forward to hearing any other questions that you may have in the future. Thank you.